The following program is video supplemental instruction. VSI is brought to you by the Teaching Center, UF's Learning Support Center, www.teachingcenter.ufl.edu. This is the determining question types and order practice. In this practice, we're going to go over how to figure out what the question types that the LSAT logic theorem section is going to be asking you is and also once you determine the question types what order to place them in the there's a PDF available under this video so that you can either print it out or read along while we go over this you can either try to do it yourself and then check your answers or you can do it as we do it so I won't be I won't be writing down the questions themselves So this is a typical set of questions that you're going to see for any given section, uh, for any given game on a logic game section. You can have anywhere from five to six to seven questions per game. You're still, um, you're going to have around 22 to 23, I think, uh, game uh, questions total. So one, one, one game will have five questions, another game will have seven, another game will have six. And, but they'll all total to around 22 to 23 questions. So this one we have seven, seven questions, uh, typical of what you'll see in it for any given logic game. And the first question reads, if the shot put is the last event of the competition, then what is the minimum possible number of events between the pole vault and the shot put? So right there you have that if at the beginning of the sentence is kind of the trigger for instruction for knowing that it's an instruction question and then it also gives you an instruction it says if the shot put is the last event of the competition so right there that's the clue that you're going to start working off of if we were diagramming this we would put the shot put as the last event of the competition because that's what the the question uh, that's the clue or instruction that the question gives us so he will put in instruction I'm not going to uh, start ordering them yet. We're going to go over what each question is first, and then we'll go over the, the ranking. Ideally, once you're actually doing the game, you're going you're gonna to do this more or less at the same time. So, uh, so the first one's instruction, but we also have to figure out which type of instruction. Because remember that there's four types of instruction. There's could be true, could be false, must be true, and must be false. And it's important to know which one it is because you have to do them in that order. So it reads, if the shot put is the last event of the competition, then what is th what is the minimum possible number of events between the pole vault and the shot put? So it's asking you, given this instruction, given this premise, what is the minimum possible number of events between any two um, Elements, so it's it's a must be true, because it's it's saying what is the minimum? There's only one number that can fit that. There's only one minimum number of events, and it has to be the minimum number of events. So, in this case, this question is going to be a must be true. And it's actually good that we had this um, example because a lot of times you don't have. A question that outright explicitly states whether it could be true or must be true or, or what have you so a lot of times you have to kind of just logically figure out what it's asking you and what type of question in terms of could be true must be true um, could be false must be false the second question reads which one of the following cannot be true of the long jump event so here you have that trigger which the question begins with the word which, which is the trigger for a broad question. Again, not always, but we know that 
we can start leaning towards it being a broad question. And then we also just know that reading it, it doesn't give you any clues. It doesn't give you any instructions. It's asking you a very broad question about the long jump event. Which one of the following cannot be true of the long jump event? So, it's a broad question. Three reads. Which one of the following is an acceptable schedule of the events of a competition? So this one's asking you for the total package, the total um, lineup. And we remember from the intro uh, lesson that any question that asks you for a complete and accurate list of the entire, of what it's asking you for, of what the game is asking you for, we know it's going to be a plugger to it. fourth question reads, if the high jump is the third event, then which of the following could be true? Again, you have that if trigger. It's also giving you an instruction. It's telling you the high jump is going to be the third event. So, you know, it's an instruction. And when you're, when, when you're doing this on the game itself, you don't have to write out the whole word. You can either abbreviate or you can just use the first letter. I use the first letter. Uh, most of the time and or a lot of the times for the instruction questions I won't even write instruction I'll just write whether it's a could be true must be true uh, could be false must be false because I know that if I write that it's an instruction so for four we have to also figure out what type of instruction it is this one's a little, a little easier because it says if the high jump is the third event then which of the following could be true so you know This is a could be true. Five reads, if the condition that the high jump must be scheduled immediately after the pole vault is removed and all the other conditions remain, then which of the following must be true? So this one's asking you to change one of the rules. It's saying that there's a, there's a rule, a condition, that the high jump has to be scheduled immediately after the pole vault, but we're throwing that out the way. And whenever we do that, whenever we either change a rule or remove a rule, it's going to be a variation. Six reads, which, of the fo which one of the following could be false? Uh, very broad, you have that which trigger, doesn't give you an instruction, so you know it's a broad. And seven reads, if the long jump is scheduled immediately after the high jump, then each of the following could be true except. Okay, so you have that if word, the, the trigger, and then it's giving you an instruction. It's telling you that the long jump is going to be scheduled immediately after the high jump. So you know it's an instruction. And you have to watch out for this one because it says then each one of the following could be true except. So it's not a could be true. It's telling you that out of the five answer choices, four are going to be a could be true. Four of them could be true. And the answer you have to find out is the one that can't be true. So in other words, you have to find out the one that must be false. So this is a must be false. And now we'll go over the actual ranking of them. So if you remember from the from the introduction lesson, your first question is always going to be your plug and clue. These are the easiest. They don't involve the diagram. They take 30 seconds once you start doing them, maybe even faster than that. They're really, uh, really easy. And this should always be done first. You're not always going to have one, but a lot of the time, I think three out of the four have one for any given section or something like that. I mean, you're, you're going to see them. You're going to see plenty of them. So, okay, so your second group of questions you're going to attack after the uh, plug and clue are going to be your instruction questions, but you have to do them in that certain order. So if we remember, the first one that we do in, in the instruction questions are the could-be-trues. 
So this is going to be 2. Now you have must be true, must be false. And if you remember from that list, from the intro lesson, the must be true goes before the must be false. So we'll have that at 3, must be false at 4. Now your two broad questions, there's no real um, order that you have to do them. If you look at the questions themselves and you have a preference personally, then do it in that order. But there's no specific order you have to do them. So if you want, you can just mark this like this so that you know that you can do either or. And your variation questions are always last. They change up the rules. They throw a big wrench in the whole thing. So you always want to leave that last because you always want to do your easier ones first. Remember, every question on the LSAT, every single question on every single section is worth exactly the same. It's worth one point. So it, it, you're better off doing the easier ones, the less time consuming ones first, because if you're left with no time at the end, you want it to be the hard ones. You want to have done the most you the most amount of questions you could have done, and the easiest questions you could have done, so you know you, you got those right. And if worse comes to worse, you can guess on, on, on the harder ones. But the variations are definitely the hardest ones. And I went over this on the, on the, on the um, intro lesson, the fact that this is very important to do, and that a lot of people don't like to do that extra step. They don't see the benefit of it. But I, I would suggest that you at least try it a couple times and I guarantee that if you do try it, you will see the benefit. Because I didn't use it when I was first taught it. And once I started using it a little bit more, especially after I got a hang of it, it, it really helped me out. It saved me so much more time, and it helped me actually solve the questions. Because just to give a quick example, say we're doing, say we're doing a game, and you have a bunch of could be trues first and you do those first those are easy so they're going to take up less time and then say that you know so you have three done and they're asking you to put an order you know certain cer something in order from a through f um so the first one is or from a through e Now say you get to your must be false and your question is it must be false that A is in which one of these columns? You know, the columns are or that A is in which one of these positions. Automatically from doing your could be trues, you know that A can be in one, two, and three. So if you have any answer choice that says that it must be false that A is in one, two, or three, you can knock those out immediately. So not only is it faster to do the could be trues, but you're gonna save you're you're gonna save that time since it's faster, and it's also gonna save you time on the harder ones because you're gonna have information on your diagram that's gonna help you answer those those harder ones down the road. So it's very I mean it's very important, it's very useful. And this concludes the determining question types and ordering practice. If you have any questions, you can email us at lsat180uf at gmail.com. Again, that's lsat180uf at gmail.com. The Teaching Center, UF's Learning Support Center, www.teachingcenter.ufl.edu.